before I start the show. If you're listening to this on the day it comes out, and if you live in Vancouver, Effin Rad is going to be at the TGR Flying High Again premiere November 9th at the Rio Theater for two shows. This is IF3's pick for Snowboard Movie of the Year. Also, it won Best Backcountry Part and Best Urban Part. Go to tetongravity.com for tickets to Mike Hatchett's Flying High Again. I know I want to watch this one on the big screen. You should too. And there will be prizes. Link to tickets in our bio. The Effenrad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Skyview Campers. This game-changing tiny home camper is built by Never Summer in Denver, Colorado. Inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, these 12-foot lightweight campers at just 1,500 pounds are a masterpiece in design. Enjoy sleeping like royalty under the stars on a true queen-size mattress with a moonroof in your secure home-like bedroom surrounded by ample ventilation and shades for privacy. Stay cozy with a propane heating system and enjoy well-lit interiors powered by rooftop solar panels. And when it's time to cook, ingenious exterior countertops include a sink and a double burner stove all under a giant batwing awning. Skyview Campers, redefining adventure. Visit skyviewcampers.com to start your journey today. Wired Snowboards offers quality hand-built custom snowboards built and tested in the coastal mountains. Wired has built me several one-of-a-kind boards that have stood up to my daily shred habit. In fact, my first Wired Chase is still my go-to PAL board after seven seasons. Wired brings my imagination into existence. That's fucking rad. Check out wiredsnowboards.com and design yourself a board to last a lifetime. Fixed snowboard bindings are simple, durable, and functional, featuring tool-free adjustments and a lifetime warranty on buckles and base trays. Fix makes bindings you can count on. Jason Bros created Fix after a bald face trip where his bindings failed and he vowed to build the world something better. I've been riding Fix buckles for the last three seasons, and they're still like brand new. He's on to something. Fix snowboard bindings built better. Rip Curl Outerwear is designed to search further in the snow, offering strength, durability, and all-around performance. Whether you're venturing into the backcountry or on the resort, Rip Curl Outerwear's got you covered. With a team that includes Chris Rasman and DCP, you can be confident that Rip Curl prides itself on creating jackets and pants with technical features that will keep you comfortable on your search. For over 35 years, the Boardroom Snowboard Shop has been Vancouver's premier snowboard shop. Check out the Boardroom's unmatched selection of snowboards, bindings, boots, outerwear, and everything you need to shred The Boardroom's passionate staff and performance guarantee ensures you'll love what you buy. And remember, the Boardroom ships to anywhere in North America. So go to boardroomshop.com or visit their stores in Vancouver and North Van. The Boardroom Snowboard Shop. Outlive your friends with New Green's Turbocharged Organic Drink Mix. New Green's is a great tasting 100% organic, vibrant green juice mix and they include sprouted seeds that leave the food in its most natural, healthful, raw state for fast digestion and maximum health. Use code EFFINRAD at newgreens.com for 20% off your new daily breakfast routine. New Greens, my daily go-to. Stay tuned after the show for a chance to try New Greens for free. Support also comes from Mount Seymour, Grouse Mountain, Cypress Mountain, the Pro Standard GoPro Accessories, and our friends at 1910. You can use code EFFINRAD at checkout for 20% off at 1910.com. I've set the intention that EFFINRAD Season 9 will include a big focus on mental wellness, so I'm stoked to be partnering with The Haven on beautiful Gabriola Island. The Haven's 40 years of experience sharing knowledge about how to live more effectively as humans has helped many people. I just got back from a five-day retreat, and I described the experience as transformative. I know I've spoken a lot about psychedelic-assisted therapy, so I feel the need to say this was not that, 
and it was just awesome. The Haven has a full range of programs based on a foundation of radical honesty. Tap into your inner resources and liberate yourself from self-defeating patterns within the context of a group in it together, helping to provide empathy, witnessing, and self-acceptance. Go to haven.ca for more program information and use FNRAD10 at checkout for a discount. Also, feel free to DM me your questions about the Haven. Jamie Lynn and Scope make art together. Scotty Daniels linked up with these two legends to help create 1910, a brand where they're using art to bring people together, and they truly believe that collaboration is the key to progression. I drove all the way to Mecca in Denver to meet up with Scope, Jamie, and Scotty, 25 hours through the mountains and desert into an art show like no other. With legends like Travis Rice, Rick Alden, Ben Belock, Chad Otterstrom, Mike LeBlanc, Jeff Pensiero, and many more, having conversations and appreciating the works of this week's guests, who sat down in the middle of that space while music blasted and tattoo artists did their thing, and we chatted about 1910. I mean, early Japan, my first trip going over there was like 1991. Holy fuck. And I was still writing for Lip Tech. I was still essentially in high school. I graduated in 92. Yep. So going over to Japan in those early days, they're really, I mean, it was pretty raw. You know, like it was, the infrastructure wasn't there. It wasn't built up the way it is now. Just getting from point A to point B, if you didn't speak or read Japanese, you were in trouble. You yeah. Know? And, and we had a, a, someone that was over there, this guy, J.P. Martin. Oh, I love J.P. Yeah. J.P. Martin was working with our distributor, Mike Miyazawa. And he, uh, you know, he once, I mean, once we got off the plane, we got picked up by the distributor we probably got laid up in a hotel by the airport and then taken to the train station in the morning and then dropped off at the train station with the instructions that we we're going to board a train and at like 345 exactly you right. get off <laughs> oh shit you won't know where you're at you won't know what you're doing you you won't you you know it's not going to tell you in english keep your eye on your watch like, just get S- off set the at time 345 exactly things run on clockwork over there it's right, so precise. right 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 so at 345 we get off the train in like you know hakuba somewhere up in the you know nagano area and there was jp martin wow so from then you know and, it, and but those early days i think we established a lot of connections and relationships and made a, a great impact on the scene and the culture over there that i saw kind of build and nurture and grow over the next 10 20 30 years of going over there hell yeah um even the even the even two years down the line or three years down the line like i remember watching matt cummins like sign this guy's north face jacket and it's probably like a thousand dollar north face jacket and the guy was, and asked for a big big sign big signature so matt took this huge like sharpie and just drew this like massive wave and like a bunch of stuff on there and i was like holy crap man he just like ruined this guy's thousand dollar north face jacket but that set this precedent where then that trip and years afterwards people would come up and ask for artwork or or a big signature and it kind of started this thing where you know that's just what you did was like sign it sign it big that's fucking awesome but that was 91 probably by 90 you know 94 when i first got my pro model 95 96 the scene and the 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 crowds and the lines you know i'd go over there for trade shows and um and just have these lines that were deep and i would and i would sit there and just sign everything (laughs) shirts shoes hats cigarette packs goggles purses babies (laughs) helmets anything everything yeah and and that's kind of where i got started like you know doing little cats you know i i saw a little like probably like a Hello Kitty, you know, or someone asked me to draw like a Hello Kitty, so I did a little cat, and then they 
then a bunch of girls would come up ask for more cats so i just start like drawing. is that for real that really i yeah. i've told you this before but we had a 30-year mystery um someone came in to the shop from japan and asked if we had a jamie lynn boot cut and we were like boot cut we don't know what that is and everyone in the shop was trying to figure out boot cut boot cut for years we would say jamie lynn boot cut and then it's the jamie lynn buddha cat yeah no there was a graphic that would have this cat it was like a uh i mean i took a lot of uh like inspiration and 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 ideas off of like a t- tibetan tonka paintings sick and i think i did a version of kind of a buddha posture with a cat you know it was like a a, a buddha in a, a lotus position but it had cat heads instead of i remember it head. yeah yeah and that was like the that, i think that lip tech graphic was called the buddha cat yeah that's exactly it i yeah. saw it in a magazine years and years later because a Japanese photographer who lives in Vancouver, and I'll cut his name in here, John Cammy, just on Craigslist was giving away his magazine collection. It's like snowboard magazines free. I drove out to his house, boxes and boxes of these old Japanese mags. And they had different shit over there than we had here. And the Buddha cat was on, you know, some stormy ad or yeah. something. Yeah. And uh, I remember we didn't get many of those. That was the year of the hibiscus boards, I think. I remember them being ribbed. Yeah. The, the Buddha yeah, cats. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, you know, there was so much great marketing happening um, during that time where, you know, board sales would be, like, astronomical. And there was no way that it was physically possible for those numbers to be relative on North America through retail shops. <laughs> <laughs> because i mean boards were buying like thousands of boards at a time oh wow but they couldn't you know the the, the community and the number of people that were going into those shops just it wasn't logical and we realized like those shops were padding those orders and then boxing them up as soon as they'd come in off the ups truck they'd get boxed up and shipped straight over to japan right because the market over there was insane yeah. we had japanese store owners come to the boardroom and just pay retail mm-hmm. for boards. That's what I was going to say. They'd yeah. come in and pay retail and then turn around and, you know, buy a board for three, four, five hundred bucks, go over and sell it for a thousand dollars all day long over in Japan. Let's get you close to that mic and we'll, uh, we'll talk about, did you, when, when did, did you ever go to Japan? Like during your pro career? Uh, no, not, not to Japan, but like we were in, we went over there for an art show. Um, a Vulcan art show. Um, ten years of, I think it was a shop out there, man, and yeah, went out there and smashed out a bunch of artwork. But that's the only time that I've actually, yeah, been over in in Japan. I've never shredded there. You didn't get to shred. Nah, this yeah, January I will be. There. Like I've got a trip coming up, but who are you going with? It's a Vans thing, man. It's it's to do with um, Vans Asia. Nice. And they want me to do like a mural thing for them and. Yeah, it's been worked out at the minute. So, yeah, 40 God, January. I love Vans. The best. I just always rinse them for slip-ons, but they never give them. <laughs> yeah. I always remember that time. <laughs> I kicked off at, well, I didn't kick off. I was just taking a piss out of a Casillo once and I said, look, mate, where are my slip-ons? And, yeah, he thought I'd been dead serious, but I wasn't. Anyway. <laughs> How is yeah, Casillo's not there anymore? Somebody else now, huh? Brixton. Yeah, he's doing Brixton, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, he was there for a good long time. Yeah, yeah, he had a he had a great run, you know. And um, we've seen a couple of people that have been there for a long time um, move on. Right Doug, now, Doug yeah. Palladini, oh, Jerry man. Bevins, yeah, um, Maddie Patty. You know, now Kevin, you know, business is tough. Yeah. And yep. it's, it's uh, just thankful that I've been able to, with the companies that we've been a part of, like still have a relationship with, you know, people like Volcom, Vans, uh, just Lip Tech, you know, the, having those guys still be around and be with us and be supportive is huge, but it's really hard to see, you know, friends and 
people that we've grown up with transition out of those positions. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're, you're happy for them that they get, you know, new positions other places. You know, I remember, yeah, Bobby Meeks leaving, leaving Nike was like a pretty big deal. But I mean, where he's at now is super sick, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. It's a big got, company, a lot of people. I got something to add to that Japan trip. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, we had, we had a run of art. Uh, we started in Norway, went down to France, went to Spain, spent a month in France, South Coast, amazing oh, wow. with Broken Europe. Um, got offered a, a mural opportunity on one of the rooftops of their, of their offices. Um, had fun painting this huge Volcom piece for him. And then we kind of, you know, we might have posted something or put it out there. And then um, and then we got a call from Volcom Japan that said, hey, we're having an anniversary party for a Volcom store in Harajuku. Um, you guys want to come over and be a part of it, have an art show. We'd love to facilitate that opportunity. So we were like... Heck yeah! I was like, hey, I you know, I I got the text, and I was like, hey, Scope, you ever been to Japan? He's like, no, dude, I've never been to Japan. I was like, you want to go to Japan? And he was like, fuck yeah, let's go to Japan. So we flew over there, and uh, got, um, we ended up getting BMX bikes. Nice. Um, we had BMX bikes in Tokyo for two weeks. Come on. And we just canvassed the city, got a bunch of art supplies, flew over there with nothing essentially outfitted ourselves at this incredible art store called Tokyo Hands. It's like a five-story art store in downtown Tokyo. Oh, most wow. amazing art store I've ever been to. But we stockpiled a bunch of art, a bunch of canvas, and then we set up at um, Bokum's Japan offices somewhere kind of around, like, I think it's like, it's right outside of Harajuku, but it's, um, I want to say Shinjuku. And we would sleep in pretty late, get started pretty late, paint pretty late, but have a great time painting. But then the fun was after we stopped painting at like 10, 11 o'clock at night, we would go hit the streets of Tokyo. With the BMX like bikes. What a life. Yeah. And then like drink until, you know, we'd go and find just random pubs, random bars places that you could drink over there until about seven o'clock in the morning and then the fun was like getting lost in the streets of tokyo to find our way back to our airbnb it was always <laughs> it was always a challenge well you have a pretty good background in bmx i think for your 50th dini posted or someone posted the the back like the oh, yes. the, the yeah, 360 a 360 attempt yeah. that was like multiple crashes yeah. before it actually went down like yeah that. bmx was something that uh I mean, growing up on Vashon Island, that was my key to, like, freedom. So I got, you know, into, like, dirt jumping and stuff as, like, a really young kid, eight, nine years old. And then when I moved off of Vashon Island, um, started riding BMX at one of the local racetracks. And uh, I was sharing. We, we had one bike, and it was my little brother and I. That's we amazing. We both raced the same bike. That's incredible. So there was times where I'd be standing in the gate staging before my race as my little brother was riding the bike that we shared. <laughs> so I just up. didn't even have my own bike. What kind of bike was it? It was a Torker. I don't even know what that is. It's amazing, like double top tube, like, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Wow, sick. Yeah, really, yeah. really. I mean, it was a gift from one of our employees that worked at our sprout farm when I was a kid. And it was like, we got, you know laced it out with a little you know some wheels and made it more like race ready sure but we still shared it that's the know. that's but such then an race, amazing race enough to like get up into i think I, I you know collected trophies until i got really close to becoming like um you know like a 10 11 12 year old expert and then i saw a bmx magazine that had chris miller and this BMX cat, Eddie Fiola, and it was like, who's rider? But it was who's rider two, so I didn't, I don't know. <laughs> I never caught the who's rider one, but the who's rider two is these two cats, and they're getting down in Upland Skate Park when that was still around. Wow. That kind of tells you the vintage of when this was happening. But yep. um, 
I was I, I saw a picture of like Chris Miller doing a, a, a one foot judo and then a BMX doing a one foot judo and it was like who's rider and I was like all right I know who's rider and I went and bought my first skateboard. <laughs> nice. That's incre- that's insane. Scope, you got any BMX background or was the the BMXing in in Japan nah, your all, mate. entry to it? I mean, the closest I've got is um, when I left school, I used to be a butcher, and I used to have like a butcher's bike. I don't even small know what wheel. that is, mate. Not many people do. I'm putting a put. Uh, I'll put it in the background. Think about it in your head, bike. like try and get that vision of a small wheel on the front, a big wheel on the back, a wooden box where you put the meat in the front. And like, it's got like a, underneath the crossbar, it's got like a, a name of the butchers on it. Yeah. Like proper old school, man. It was like an antique. And now they actually keep this bike outside the front of the shop because it was that old. Oh, sick. What's the name of the shop? I'll look it up and put it on there. Uh, Fenton, Fenton's Butchers. It was like a, a family run business. Um, my boss at the time, now he's passed, but his son's taking it on a good friend of mine and yeah, it was pretty funny. It was like, that's the closest I got to push bikes and all the rest of it. Cause every Saturday I used to have to push around like, you know, you'd have like a, a joint of ham and half a pound of bacon or something. And yeah. And the handlebars were like, not like, yeah, they kind of came up like old school, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the closest I got to anything like that. You know? So then BMXing in Japan, you're just tooling around following him. We Remember were just avoiding. Rides? We, we yeah, were just kind yeah. of avoiding being pandered by people. To be honest, yeah. we were yeah. like, just wanting to, yeah, because we'd work in this place till whatever time it was, and then. I remember one night I just said to Jim, "I'm like, mate, I've got to get out of here. Like, this is doing my head in. Like, just um, we ended up in some weird little zone, didn't we? Like, loads of little pubs in, like dead small pubs or bars. Um, yeah, and we ended up just cruising around and. I think we cruised around on these BMXs for like all night. He ended up in a like a fucking central reservation on a dual carriageway or something or whatever it was. I, I don't know what happened, but yeah, all I could see is his two feet sticking up. But yeah, we were just cruising around. <laughs> all we wanted was like bacon and eggs, maybe right, some hash right, browns. Right, right. So I looked on my phone. I'm like, hey, there's a Denny's that's, you know, a couple miles this way let's go find and like because we were eating pretty traditionally like ramen and chicken katsu and just kind of like however bento stuff that we could find throughout the day but we after drinking until seven o'clock in the morning we we're like fuck let's just find some like <laughs> yeah, uh, bacon and eggs you know so we pedaled like i mean we were, we were just rinsed so we we're like three sheets and we pedaled <laughs> to this like denny's we had a waitress that had a peg leg. No, she didn't have peg legs. She had like a, a riser block. Yeah. Oh, right, right. right. Oh, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was awesome. I don't know, it, but it was like an interesting uh, uh, setting for this Denny's. Like, Sounds like a, like a movie. Yeah. yeah. It was like a refreshing break to get just a, a runny eggs and some like half-cooked bacon. We were happy as clams. But when we get out of there, we realize like we're really far away from our Airbnb. So we just started pedaling and pedaling and pedaling, <laughs> getting lost and more lost <laughs> in Tokyo, not really knowing where we're going. And at one point in time, I think we hill bombed down a hill, wasn't looking where I was going, steered into the curb and ended up like cartwheeling into this median of brush, laugh, kind of like kind of lapping the whole time. Two fucking legs sticking out of the, <laughs> the, the central reservation. Like, and Jim's legs are just like upside down. I'm like, what, what the fuck's he doing? Was he hurt or was it? Oh, fuck, don't know. Don't even know. No, no. We, we were too off cut, mate. We were like, yeah, two sheets to the wind. So if he was. <laughs> it's fun to go yeah. for, a, for a full speed bail on a bike when you're drunk. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's funny, man. Yeah, I yeah. did. I did a couple bales off of those weird rental scooters last night. Yeah, yeah. Just ditched it in the road and like, hand, like I, I'm surprised I don't have like a screaming hand today. It hurts, but uh, in her eyes, it I hurts think a also when you're a bit tipsy, like you bounce a little bit better. You don't tense up. You're yeah, just, you don't like, tense relaxed. up. You just bounce and yeah. Well, yeah. that's exactly what he did. He was like, yeah, in a bush, two <clears> feet up. That's amazing. Yeah, pretty funny, man. That's insane. 
when you guys show up at Volcom anywhere or any place where you're going to do a big mural, does the does the atmosphere at the place? I guess you wouldn't know because you weren't there before. But I'd imagine the atmosphere kind of changes. It's like, hey, we got the we got the art guys here. We got the reason that we do this thing happening live at our work. You know, like where usually Monday to Friday you kind of go in, you ship some units, you do your thing. I don't know. I guess maybe Volcom's not completely like that. That seemed like a pretty cool company. It's kind of good, man. It's. I mean, what Emma got offered is like with that studio space, like it, it's really rad that we can, especially, you know, coming over from the UK to be able to know that I've got a studio to work in. It's the bollocks, man. Um, and like we can, yeah, Scotty's got his own program going off, obviously works for the brand and everything and does his thing, but we can basically just work until we want, you know, like this past week, you know, we had a couple of late nights, not how it used to be, but like it's just like, you know, work till about 12 or 1 or something and, and then tap out. And it's just cool to have that opportunity to be able that's, to. That's you know. dad life late. That's dad life late. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah. not young, free. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool, man. I mean, it's, I mean, I can't thank those guys enough. Like Vulcan, you know, what my guts done, like to help us have that. And, here he is. See exactly what he just said. Yeah. I think he just said yippee ki yay. Coming Come in, on Dale. Up. Nice. Oh, he's going to want down right away. Huh? <laughs> Are there any other companies like Volcom that you guys like? Do you have you gone and painted at like? the Costa Mesa Vans headquarters? We did. Like when Vans moved to that new Costa Mesa place, yeah. we did like a mural for those guys. It was called The Homecoming and we painted a piece for those guys and um, I do a, I do a lot of work with Dragon. Um, I did some stuff years ago with those guys and I mean, LibTech's up in Seattle but um, otherwise we did, yeah, we did this wall piece for Vans. Um, Maybe on that same run that we did Japan and all the rest of it, we came back and... Yeah, you guys have had some runs, hey? Like, just like years of traveling, painting, following the stoke. Like, okay, these guys want a mural over here. Sounds good. Now we're going there. I think sometimes it's nice as well just to be able to go have nothing else to think about and you can just say, yeah, let's, let's do that. And for me, that's when my art tends to just, I can do it a lot easier. Yeah. You know, like, say, if, for instance, when Jim said about Japan, I'm like, yeah, because I've got nothing else stopping me. There's nothing else saying, oh, shit, I've got to do this. I've got to go back to this nine to five or something like that. I can. Yeah. And being able to do that, I can paint and work a lot better. You know, it, it, it flows shit loads better for me, like without any other things going off. Um, and I guess being an artist, you're fortunate to be able to do that if you can pull it off. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> Jamie, how has uh, having Thalo changed your, uh, the anchor, the anchorless boat thing? Like, are, are you now at a, uh, is, are you, do you feel like you're doing the nine to five thing, like dadding all day? And I mean, yeah, it's a different, it's a different experience. For sure. I mean, but you know what, man? I'm so, so thankful that all those years that I took the opportunity to get out there and enjoy the world with just myself, with nothing really to answer to or no one really to go home to. Like, I, I feel like I experienced that selfish aspect of life to its fullest. Sure. Yeah. And, and it's not like I have to put it in a box and like put it on the shelf you know it just it just you know you change you, you know you change and 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 it's a new chapter and it's a it's like i love being a dad i love having a little dude in our life that's just i i want to include him on more chapters ahead that are able to put ourselves out there in the world for more life experience that's cool. It's a little shifted, you know, like it's not as loose as it once was. It's more stuff. You got to bring a lot more yeah. stuff. 
like yeah. car seats and backpacks full and of it, diapers. It, it's and just shit. like before, like when I'm, I was out there, like I didn't care if I slept on a dog mat in the corner of uh, the down on the street or what, whatever. Sure. It's like now I know I have to, you know, we have to have a good thoughts of sleep, eat, you know, the amenities. Amenities. Yeah. And before when I was running loose wild and free <laughs> i didn't really care about that that was secondary yeah like yeah. i didn't i didn't really didn't mean too much if like i had anything to eat or if i had any place to sleep but if i was having a good time that was paramount yeah uh -huh. yeah well Thalo travels good obviously travels well he's pretty easy easy going moving around yeah i yeah. mean we, we've still been able to hit the road you know we've done a couple trips from washington to couple times to utah um colorado for this trip went to montreal and uh toronto this summer oh, see some family out there red and um and planes trains and automobiles man it's nothing really that slows him down he's stoked <laughs> just to be out there with us doesn't matter where it is you just had your 50th and it was at la push mm -hmm. was he there for that yep and was everybody just camping and stuff? There were so yeah. many people. Yeah. I mean, La Push is a magical spot. And it's a cool spot that I, I wanted to bring everyone together to, not only to experience just a, um, what the natural beauty it has to offer, but also it's like it's great for tent camping. It's got some cabins and it's got a little hotel. Sick. So it kind of gives you a variety of accommodation option. Yeah. Yeah. And uh there's a lot of people in tents or a little like pop-ups on top of their truck, but a couple of people in caverns, you know, like I think uh, everybody, no matter where they were staying, was able to, we got some really lucky weather. It's beautiful. That's good surf, true. good sun. It's a good time. Was Travis there with, with his yeah. whole family? Travis, uh, not with his family, but him and Rasman were out. Chris. Sick, sick, sick. And, um, I mean, they've been doing a lot of foil surfing. Tons. Which yeah. Which is pretty amazing. Yep. You know, fairly uh, athletic endeavor to be able to keep pumping the gas pedal. Oh, wow. That's quite loud. You know, if it wasn't the Melvins, I'd probably be a little Let's bit Let's keep bummed, it going. Melvins, we sound like, good. Just like, man, love that stuff. Yeah, the Melvins were badass. I remember the Melvins, somebody asked them something about Nirvana, because Nir Nirvana really shouted out the Melvins, right? Like, they're from the, they're both from Seattle, are they not? And uh, the Melvins were like, they gave no love back. Oh, they're so like, it no, it, 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 you know. Driving to La Push for his birthday bash. What is it, Aberdeen they're from? Aberdeen, yeah. right? Yeah. They're both Seattle is a yeah. broad term yeah. for yeah. the yeah, yeah, yeah. Pacific That's Northwest right. for That's music. Right. Yeah, but the Melvins came out of Montesano. Yeah, and yeah. it's just south of Aberdeen where Kurt and Chris from Nirvana came from. Grew up, right? And right. Uh, and it's it's about two hours south, two and a half hours south of Seattle. Like Aberdeen's about three hours, but two hours south is Olympia, which is a really um, kind of a college town that brings a lot of that scene together yeah and it's only 45 minutes from aberdeen to drive to olympia where the olympia college was and so i think that that was kind of the catalyst for a lot of those bands yeah that sound of that came out of yeah that came out of seattle just fucking epic yeah you know being that close to it like growing up in the in in washington and in south of seattle during that time like at the time like you're so caught up in it as a kid like i, I was still listening to ozzy and black sabbath and iron maiden and then there was this like new like a new music that came out and it was like you know you didn't really it didn't really sink in that this was something that was changing the dynamic of the genre of music until later you know like nirvana played in places where you know my first like really punk rock show was a melvin's concert at an elks club seriously and it was an elks club that probably had like 50 people there that's amazing and and i saw and i was like oh this is like crazy noise you know i couldn't wrap my head around it because i'm i'm like i'm into like polished studio heavy metal what's up dude 
Scope, you uh, you were talking about Motorhead on the ride over here, and how oh, it, my, I it, always talk about yeah, Motorhead. yeah, and how it influenced the the pieces that you guys did. In, you did those in in California. We did getting ready in, for this in the studio down at Vulcan, and um, Scotty literally messaged me and went, "What well, are the names for the songs and um, uh, for the the pieces?" And I was like, "Well, I was listening to Motorhead at the time, and Hellraiser came on with Ozzy and." Lemmy, and I was like, right, the Tiger one's called Hellraiser. Um, no Voices in the Sky for uh, the Reaper piece, and then two eagles, one eagle scream, and all down to like just listen to, you know, lyrics. And I, I, nine times out of ten, I always name the paintings after lyrics, you know, or, or songs, or um, that's where I get most of my inspiration from, so. Yeah. So was that what you were listening to while you're painting them as well? Oh, mate, we were listening to all sorts. Um, Fu Manchu, High on Fire. Um, yeah, Motorhead, Sabbath, Nebula. Yeah, like, we, yeah, it's basically just fucking, yeah, all the music we listen to. So. <laughs> yeah. My daughter just sent me a Spotify playlist for my long drive. It was so sweet. She picked a bunch of... What's on it? Um... She picked a bunch of, like, Primus was on there, which I was like, fuck yeah, that's dope. Some butthole surfers. Yeah. Um, just early, like, snowboard video soundtrack stuff. I, I don't know where she would have yeah. got it from. She's into the strokes. That's her... That's her... A bit of Iggy Pop. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I yeah. always remember when I was at my grandparents once, and... Um, there was a TV program in England called Passenger and they played the Stooges song Passenger when it came on. And yeah. I was like, my God, what is that? What's that sound? You know, like I'd never heard it before. Yeah. And it totally got, I must've been 13, 14 years old. Um, I remember listening to that song going, fuck me. That's the bollocks. That song. And like, yeah. I've never heard of the Stooges, you know. Because I was young, but yeah, yeah. I, got, I didn't get I didn't get to the Stooges until I was quite old. Yeah, you know what I mean. Same with Alice Cooper, yeah. which Alice Cooper uh, has a bunch of hits that got played on the radio a lot in Canada. And I always thought he was kind of like a fake Ozzy Osbourne guy, like an Ozzy copy cat or something. Yeah. But his his like early stuff, his his catalog is deep and he's fucking good I never really got into him like when I was growing up uh, first concert I went to was Def Leppard and Saxon that's amazing and I just remember that lyric denim and leather work well together and I was like what the fuck is this this is the best thing <laughs> and then I'm like shit Def Leppard there's a Def Leppard and a one armed drummer that shit out of luck you know like Christ but um, yeah just coming from the north of England we had all that you know all those bands like even from Zeppelin, even though they were a little bit more south and they were in the Midlands and, well, Sabbath were in the Midlands as well, but Motor, they were more north and, yeah, we were fortunate to have all these bands that were just, even though it weren't my generation, I was getting into them when I was growing up, but... Rad. Yeah, it was cool, man. Yeah, you were talking about Ozzy moving back and how big of a deal it is. It's like, yeah. it's like national news, yeah. which is sick because, I mean, Ozzy was kind of obscure. Remember, like, growing up, it was like, you know, when when he was going through his you know hair days, and but he is such an iconic like. Oh mate, it's bigger news than King Charles. It's like yeah, Ozzy Osbourne's yeah, yeah. coming back to England. It's yeah, like yeah, that's where he's from. It's balls to King Charles. It's like <laughs> Ozzy's done so much for fucking a lot. You know, like he's uh, yeah with the music with who he is, what he's done in his life, and you know. Yeah. Just the way he's lived. And now he's coming back yeah. to England. It's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. It, we're getting a bit of our heritage back. Yeah, that's know? it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Getting your heritage back for sure. Yeah, he's quite the uh, he's quite the inspiration for a lot. He's of got people. a podcast out as well now, apparently. Oh, I'm gonna I've start not heard listening it, but, to it all. Yeah. yeah. Who else is in it? I think Jack and Sharon. Oh, like the family has yeah. a podcast. Yeah. That dynamic is just so sweet, mate. You're going to be listening to that back back to Vancouver, aren't you? The whole yeah, Sorry, yeah. Uh, that's my whole drive back is going to be yeah. getting caught up on Oz on the Osborne's podcast. 
Don't just love this. Scotty's just found a. Uh... Oh, nice. Yes, my lord. You want this one? I'm good. I'm good. I got water. I'm and a hangover from yesterday. Jesus. The only way of getting over it is <laughs> you only get a hangover when you stop drinking, mate. <laughs> That's the truth. I got to get past that. Holy shit. What's well, fizzy this? Where's he get it from? He shook it up right before I gave Didn't it to you. you. Like roulette. Nice. There we go. Now Sorry about go. that. That's yeah, all good. It's crazy growing up listening to that music and not really placing it, you know. Yeah. Just hearing it without yeah. um, a border. Hearing it without a geographical location. Right. You know, but just knowing that it resonates with you in a way that moved you or like it put you in a certain spot where you connected to it. But I, I think about that now when you talk about like, yeah, like, you know, all these artists that came from the UK that had, you know, for you, you knew exactly where they came from. But for me, I just knew it was heavy metal. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, right. And that was a universal, you know, a universal place that I put those bands in. Like, I didn't know exactly where Maiden came from. I didn't know exactly where Black Sabbath came from. I didn't know exactly where Ozzy. All I know is that when I got a chance to connect with that, it was like something that was like meaningful to me without that geographical designation it's interesting yeah because when we're talking about the seattle sound right like there was a real era of like where the media was just so focused on you know you could be a shit band from seattle but you probably get a record deal yeah. right like because yeah. it was that was like what was happening at that time yeah. but that was attached to a geographical place right yeah. so that was that was huge in, in England. I remember when Kurt Cobain, you know, topped himself and it was like, it was like a day of mourning at school, you know, like it was because we were so into that. I kind of skipped it. I was kind of into Caius at the time and these bands that came out of the desert, but like with Nirvana and everything, it's like that Seattle sound, you know, and every time you land into Seattle, you always think of a Nirvana song or something, you know? That is true. Like, Come As You Are or something like that. Yeah, or, that is true. And yeah. it's very much like, Seattle's very much like where I'm from back in England. It's nine times out of 10, it's wet, yeah, damp. Gray. And there's a bit of a pub culture. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's something about it, man. Like it was huge in England when I was growing up, you know? Yeah, I like think it was huge sound. all over yeah. the world. Yeah. But like it was, it, it just went nuts. Yeah. Soundgarden. Yeah, I mean, it was just fucking awesome. It's a trip, isn't it? It's like, when you listen to music now, like, what's the band now? Like, what's the band coming out with the lyrics now? What's I don't the, even know. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, there were so many cool pockets of music that we listen to, you know? Well, it's and, a soundtrack to your life. That's yeah. the thing, right? So now these the, the new soundtracks are soundtracks to the kids' generation's lives, and they'll know those things. I, when I'm thinking about place, like I can't, like you, I, I can't even imagine Liverpool doesn't have Beatles shit like yeah. everywhere, right? Oh man, yeah. Like there's Scousers love it, yeah. Th yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. People would travel there, but I'm sure people travel to Seattle to just go to the Rock and Roll Hall of yeah. Fame and or whatever it is, music, music museum. I, I, but they've got real shit in there from Kurt. I've gone to his house. You know, I went to the house. Really? Yeah, you can just go there, man. It's crazy. What's it like? Eerie. It's eerie because you see the garage. Like you kind of have to. Is line that because you know that he topped yeah. himself? Uh, yeah. Or what? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. And there's a bench just out, out like, you know, kind of where you can see it, and yeah. everybody's carved their shit in there, and 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 yeah. wrote notes to him and shit. Yeah. It's it is morbid, isn't it? It's like a, you know, it's like a, I don't know, it's a, it's a crypt almost. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like you're going to a graveyard. That's exactly and they, what and it they haven't like. changed any of the setting. They haven't demolished the garage, or, and you can still look into the window where he essentially sat there. Yeah, yeah. It was in the yeah. garage. That's so. Like you kind of Google like Kurt Cobain's house. And then 
it shows you the picture that, and then you're looking at the, that. You're like, holy fuck, that's the house. Who lives in there now? I don't know. Museum. Oh no, no, it's like somebody's house. Yeah, it's just somebody's place. No shit. It's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is there nobody living in it? I thought there's people. Maybe not. Put that in front. I, I, I don't think it's a spot that anybody has like bought, renovated, or wanted to rebuild from where it once was. You'd think like as far Courtney, as I know. Would, Courtney would buy it or something, you know what I mean? And, do, and yeah. just like put yeah. a dome over it or something. But it's a very quiet neighborhood. So you also feel like this kind of sense of like, Oh shit, thousands of people do this every year. Um, I want to be respectful and not, you know, disturb the people that are here. Like, I'm just here to honor this dude. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like going to Bruce Lee's grave is also in Seattle, which is super sad. um, Me and our mate, uh, uh, Ben Bruff, we went to Lemmy's grave. Oh, wow. Where's that? It's in. it's in a graveyard. I think it's called Hollywood. I, I don't know what it's called. It's a big green graveyard, basically. Yeah. I don't know what it's called in, in LA, but um, we went in there and there's like, you know, Princess Leah's grave, her mum's grave, like Dio's grave. And they're all like all singing, all dancing, like massive. Oh, wow. And then you go around the corner and Lemmy's is about like literally about two foot. There's a, a pack of cards there with an ace of spades on it. Fuck it. Loads man. of little shots of JD underneath it, but it's like so like you won't even realize it's there. But low key, all these other people got these extravagant graves and stuff. And then you get to Lemmy's and it's just like two ace of spades and yeah, Ian Fraser Kilminster. And it's like man, that's cool. You Fuck know? yeah, that yeah. dude was a dude, man. Yeah, we went there and just had a couple of shots of JD and yeah. It's funny when you go to people's graves that um, obviously have done something or, you know, like, you're like you've totally lived your life exactly how you should have, you know? Um, yeah, I've got a lot of time for that. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Like, when we travel in Mexico, if we see a graveyard, we're going there because yeah. they, they, the just the ornateness of it and the vibe, that feeling, They, I think... Mexico celebrates death in a in a very uh, like in such a they cool do it, way. They do it quite well, though, don't they? They kind of they kind of celebrate it, you yeah. know, celebrate death rather than get morbid over it. And the imagery too. Yeah. The imagery is really like it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure I like some of the stuff that you guys do is inspired by 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 that art yeah Jimbo's dead morbid so yeah he, he always paints like morbid stuff ah. <laughs> <laughs> always thinking about death and stuff and yeah what was that throw the mic in front of your face <laughs> uh, I've, I've gotten quite goth in my older age <laughs> yeah Just, you're uh, I'm trying to think because I've been following your art for since that acme you know since that first puking face acme well and you did a, a few things before that even right but that's that's almost all the way back and you've stayed pretty pretty true you've yeah. gotten really good i mean you uh, i mean uh, i improved i don't know i i drew a lot of inspiration i would go over to hawaii a lot so i drew a lot of like you know the it was kind of like really kind of floral and surf and hibiscus and plumeria and like the roberts tour buses that were driving around with like you know artwork on the side was always kind of something that resonated and and even the hawaiian airlines logo with the you know beautiful hawaiian woman with the hibiscus in her hair and and that kind of, you know, that always kind of connected and resonated with me. But, I mean, it's just uh, just traveling and absorbing your surroundings, um, having the chance to pick up 
certain, you know, or have the chance to go to museums or see art in places that are outside of your comfort zone has helped me evolve as an artist. That's and, rad. And it's really, uh, I think just lately, like having a chance to get and to get together with Scope and to be able to paint, like, you know, now that we've had a really good run of a multiple years to build kind of a catalog and a body of work together, we can we can communicate well to reference past art experience to be able to build new work and body of work together. Yeah, it's yeah. been it's been incredible learning your guys' yeah. story, like the A symbol years, you know the, you know it's it's that 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 friendship over time where you're like fuck i like hanging out with this guy so any excuse to hang out let's just do it and now you've you guys have actually gone all in and built the company around like all right let's yeah. let's do this let's let's follow that let's it may, it, i mean it's 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 been fun it's always been a, such a, a a pleasure never a chore and it just gets better each time we have the opportunity to do it. That's right. And it's really been... Uh, yeah, the art you guys made at this time in California, like the new pieces that are here, are fucking incredible. Incredible. Yeah. The, I think this time, like, we got together September 1st, and we painted till the 10th, and we did five big panels in 10 days. And that, I mean, that was kind of a... That was a more deliberate, mellower pace, which seems pretty prolific to do five pieces in 10 days but for us i think that was kind of a more of a civilized approach than what we have experienced in the past and 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 you can see it in the body of work that we did yeah everything is a lot more concise and clean and and yeah it, it tightened up our approach yeah yeah it looks a little bit tighter it's like we've done stuff before and like fuck i think maybe we did over a week's time we ended up doing like I can't remember how many pieces we did like ridiculous amounts yeah. and it was just like you'd get home and you'd be like I'm knackered now you know like we, we painted so many for a Volcom store and then like all these different panels and we did it all in like three days but this time it's just like right we've got a bit of space let's think about it let's just you know we've not been able to paint together in a long time you know and it means the world to me to be able to do that you can't really paint with anyone you know like it with me and him it's just like we just don't even have to talk it's just i've never had that before you know i've got a few people i can collaborate with but nine times out of ten it's like we just get it and we just go you know that's how it's gonna be and done and then you have a laugh doing it as well and it's like it makes you know sometimes with artists it can become like a big, you know, a big dick competition or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Whereas we've kind of got it on lock that we go, yeah, we, we understand each other's artwork and how it works and shit. And yeah, this time around, it's been so tight and you look at it and you go, you know what, that, yeah, just everything seems a little bit more crisp or something because we stepped back and we only had, yeah, 10 days, but. Well, you've created a team too. You've got, yeah. you've got people helping you now. Well, Scotty, uh, he's, yeah, I don't know where he is. I wanted, I did actually want to get him in on this podcast, yeah, nice. just to say something because I've always said to him when when we started talking about 1910, all I want to do is make art. I don't want to deal with anything else. I've right. got no time for that in my head, and I can't understand it. And Scotty kind of came in, and, and he deals with all the shit that I don't really understand. I mean, maybe Jim understands it a little bit better than I do, but. I've got no space for that in my head. I'd rather just paint, you know, yeah, and create the art that we need to do. And and Scotty's really stepped in, and you know, he's done stuff that I don't understand, like getting it in stores and accounts and whatever he's saying <laughs> to me. I just, <laughs> man, like, I can't got a goddamn clue what he's on about half the time. I love but it. As long as I can just paint, I don't give a shit about anything else, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. If if Scotty was here, it'd be cool to get him on here just to. Yeah, the next something. time he comes around, we'll get yeah. him to sit down. You yeah. guys, it, are, are the 3D pieces, is this brand new at this show? Yeah, it's, it's something that I've been doing a bit back in England and Europe. Like, got a couple of shows out there, and 
my last one was um, it was out in Lax that I actually did 3D pieces in, but it's usually on wood and a lot bigger. Um, right. And my artwork alone translates quite well into that. But then I was saying to Jim, like, you know, our artwork's going to translate just the same, you know? Yeah. So basically, I broke down, broke it down into layers, and then we, it, it, it kind of makes it something a little bit more than just a flat print and an, in between an original and a flat print, you know, like, so, you know, it gives it that different aspect as well. Like it's dynamic. Stuff, it's you know? badass is what it is. It looks fucking awesome. It would have been cool if we would, you know, if we had more time to make them a lot bigger and do it probably on wood so you can see the grain and stuff. But I think these have turned out just right. You know, it, yeah. they're not too big and people can look at it and go, you know what, I can fit that on my wall rather than having a massive door size painting or something. <laughs> yeah. You know? like, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's practical. It's pr like it's practical for sales. Right. Because a lot of the stuff you guys did collaborative, co collaboratively was for shops, right? Like, so a shop has a wall or a space where they're like yeah yeah like going going back to that japan trip man like we did there was like a mini ramp in the shop and we did like a wall in there and then also that same year the the, the wall that jim was on about on the the roof of vulcan europe it was like a huge wall and they were like do what you want sick as long as it's got a stone in somewhere obviously but yeah it's kind of cool because these brands pick up on it and, and and that year it actually spread like wildfire people were like vans and Vulcan like going you know what this is cool what you guys are doing so when real estate came up with a wall they'd be like yeah here we go so yeah yeah, yeah. it's like a niche and there you like obviously making art big like giant big yeah i art. mean it's better for us because we can work with like rattle cans like spray cans and stuff but yeah the way that jim works is more he does he does do a lot more than i do with rattle cans whereas i do a lot more with like brushwork like with doing lines and stuff but yeah like for instance the eagle pieces like he did all the fill like so it's like yeah you get the rattle can to do the blends and stuff and i don't really work like that but i kind of do the line work and stuff so when you're doing big walls, it's, it's, it's easy to work with like rattle cans and just smash the whole thing out. And it's always nice to actually get a big wall. Right, so right. So anyone out there who wants to give us massive walls. That's epic. This happened last time we were on that yeah, podcast. Yeah, I, I want to I yeah, yeah. hear about that. That's super sick. So you shouted out last time, if someone has that board that you were just talking about, your very first yeah. board. And My very first snowboard. I sold it to him and it was in his closet. No or his way. wardrobe, as English people call it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, mate, I want that back. Yeah. Because it was like, literally, I got it for Christmas. Yeah. It was a second hand board. It was, well, it meant everything to me. Yeah. You know, it was a snowboard. And, and when it snowed that, that Christmas day, I went straight to the hill and fucking learned how to snowboard, I guess. That's but, amazing. Amazing. But then I found out who's got it. Yeah. yeah, he had it in his wardrobe for time. I'm like, do you actually do anything with that? And he's still got the baseless bindings on it that oh, I have. Amazing. Like, amazing. I was like, no way, man. Like, and when I said to you on the podcast, I'm like, if you listen to this, I want that back. And then he got hold of me straight away. So He listened and he got Yeah, it so back if you've got you. any massive walls out there for me and Jim to paint, then sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the craziest thing that you guys have ever painted? Like somebody's brand new car or anything like that? You, uh, 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 this is kind of an extension of the North Face jacket, right? Like, I'm sure sometimes people go like, holy shit, if you could do art, for me, it's priceless. I think, I think the biggest piece we ever did was the cold pack piece. You know, on the back of the bowl. It was like... Obviously, that, that was years ago, man. In but Glacier. Yeah. That's probably the biggest wall we've ever done, I think. Unless I'm forgetting. That's Maybe. such a rad project. Can you shout out some of the people that were involved in getting the coal pad going? Because that was a DIY. I mean, the, the coal pad is definitely a, a, a special, holds a special place in my heart. Because, 
you know, there were guys and locals that wanted to try to develop a skatable spot up in Glacier for years. And, and this spot was kind of earlier developed. It was kind of a flat concrete pad, and they put up some jersey bears and threw a little transition in there and then um, evolved it and developed it to a certain extent. But then for decades, it, it was dormant. Yeah. And... Um, me and Ryan Davis one day were driving around and we were just like, man, it would be so cool if we could get something more up here, develop something more up here. And that's kind of where the idea sparked. And then it just, uh, you know, we had a fundraiser that Scope came up and was a part of. And essentially, like, we put up our own money to start the project. And by the time that Scope and I showed up to what they had evolved and developed it was just kind of these big eco block walls and oh nice so we, we we got up there and we were just like two sheets of the wind again just like, <laughs> down, like which is when when we when we say it's yeah 35th birthday that's that's a good 10 years ago or something you know oh wow um it was fucking cool man because obviously jimbo introduced me to all his mates that he kicked with and, and all the rest of it. And I met Ryan and everyone made me feel so welcome there, you know? Yeah, that community. I think we got sick. down on like a, a wall underneath the bridge, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we, we needed seven. We, we initially uh, uh, started a project on on property that we were squatting on. <laughs> we didn't really have essentially permission to initiate a $17,000 pour from Grindline Skate, you know. The, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. To build this clover bowl. Who's, that we, whose property was it? It ended up being this guy named Joe King. Joe King. Yeah, and he wasn't joking. Are you You? I'm dead serious. This guy, Joe King, he's a, he is... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the <laughs> Joe King, yeah. that's fucked up. So this guy, Joe King, um, after we initiated this build and like we 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 met him and he's like, hey, I, I acquired this property in a collection of properties. It's a coal pad deposit that was used for a collection site that the coal would be brought off the mountain, staged here from the smaller trucks. The bigger trucks would come, get loaded up, and take off. Essentially, it's a toxic, it's a hazardous waste site for me. Oh, oh, So shit. the only thing to really treat this area is to cap it with concrete. No way. So if you guys do a couple things, put in some infrastructure, put in some wide in the road for an EMT, if something happens, you know, get a couple porta potties so people ain't shitting and pissing out in the woods. Yeah. Um, I will gift this property as far as the coal extends to the town of Glacier for a skate park. That's fucking awesome. So yeah, Joe we, we we needed seventeen thousand dollars. We put up a couple grand to get it started. By the time Scope and I got up there, we had the the fundraiser. We ended up raising a little over twenty thousand dollars with so the contributions sick. of friends, family, and community to make that project happen. And what started as a selfish endeavor to get skateboarding possible for us as grown men turned into this community hub that now we see all these like people it's a destination skate teams are traveling up to it people are coming down from canada you know it's like the groms of the community are now have this amazing it's it's evolved into a full-blown skate park like it's it's couldn't be prouder of just helping facilitate that for the community of Mount Baker and Glacier, Washington. Glacier is like frozen in time, it feels like. Like when I moved out in 1993, I think a little bit of the buildings have changed. I'm not sure if Milano's was where it is. Maybe it was, actually. And then the bar across the street. What's, uh, it's... Um, Milano's? The Milano's is the... the Italian and then Grams, Grams, Grams is Grams. right across from Mil yeah. where Milano's yeah. is. And it's still yeah. Grams. It's yeah. nuts. And remember all the stickers 
on grams like yeah. in the 90s the, the old phone booth that's yeah, there yeah they had a spoken or they had an open mic one night so i i got up on guitar and did a really like a lounge version of a turbo negro song that's fucking epic uh, it's the only place i felt comfortable getting away with such crap i'm not getting like you know much shit for it but yeah yeah there's like five dudes at the bar all locals just like again like three sheets and then us so like hey fuck what the why why not you know yeah the biggest change for glacier and i don't even know if it's if it's considered glacier but when they put in chair nine it just it felt like it kind of moved the epicenter of where things were happening kind of up the road a little bit but that grams like small town feel like small town yeah. But it was Baker, such a big fucking deal to the snowboard community. Yeah. Um, I th- I, it's, there's something magical about it. And then the coal pad just fits in so well because now all of a sudden you've got a legitimate skate park. But you kind of got to know where it is. It's yeah. not, you don't just it's drive so by close, it. It's so close, but it's, yeah. it's, it's tucked away in a nice little spot. Yeah. And, you know, it, there used to be a bar called the Chandelier that was kind of like the go-to spot back in the 80s and 90s and stuff. And now... That's transitioned into a spot called Chair Nine, and this guy Pete that started Chair Nine, amazing dude, turned this landmark spot into another community hub. Um, has you know, does supports the art community, supports the snowboard community for all of our fundraisers. That's usually where we have the bands play. Dope. It's a it's 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 transitioned into a really the go to spot for food. There's not a whole lot of food options up there. Still. That's true. Yeah. There's no real accommodation. There's no, no. resort hotel. Right. It's like there was just uh, the AT, the only ATM in town is up at Mount Baker Lodge. There was no cell service. Like it's really <laughs> it's, true. it's a dead end road. Yeah. yeah, Pete was super sick and let me in the first year or two of F and Rad. I did a live F and Rad with Terrier at Chair Nine. It was fucking so sick. Yeah. It was dope. There, there's something that uh, I don't know if you'll know any of this, and I don't know if this will go anywhere. Holy smoke, a tavern! Do you know anything about that place? Remember, it was like a biker bar, and then yeah. it would turn into a church, and then it turned back into a biker bar for a bit, and then now I think it's a church again. Is it not? Yeah. What is up with that? That's yeah. like the fucking raddest thing ever. Yeah. Uh- no, I think it's down the road a little bit. In yeah, like, it's way uh, down the road. It's yeah, not it's in Glacier. Like, uh, yeah. You know, it's in uh, a couple of small towns on the yeah, way up. Yeah, but it's. I mean, that that's that's the the eclectic dynamic that makes that whole area something special. Yeah, yeah. I drank so in there with can, my buddies. You could pull one that time. off, but gnarly. only in that area. Yeah, it was. Yeah. A, you know, like, even even when I was up there, like growing up in. UK snowboarding, you're just watching VHSs all the time and stuff. And yeah. when he's like, "Oh, this is my mate Tex," I'm like, "I don't know <laughs> fucking exactly who you are." Yeah, dude. And Steve Graham and stuff, and I'm like, "No shit!" Like, like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Tex is a fucking the, legend, oh, dude. Oh man, like he put us up. The second trip I went up there, he was like, "Yeah, man, he's staying at my house," and I was like. It's more of a Such compound than a house, people, right? Man. Like, he's yeah. got a lot going on in yeah. his place. It's dope. Yeah, he, yeah. It is really, like, a, such a special spot. Yeah. Like, you go up to Kelly Joe's place, and there's, you know, Harry Kearney's crashing out or whatever. It's like, it's, it's the first this time tight I met Wes place. as well. Like, Wes was just like, I remember one night, I ended up getting on the beers again and ended up sleeping in a forest or something. And he tried to come and find me. And he came back to come and find me in this fucking, uh, yeah. Like, I'd only met him that week. That's and awesome. Passing out. I don't know where I passed out, but yeah. He literally came out to come and find me, and I was like, no way, man. Like, <laughs> just solid people, man, you know? Yeah. Like, maybe they're just trying to look after the Englishman, but yeah. It no, cool, there's man. a community up there. Yeah. It's a, and, and it's tight. It's yeah. tight net. It's definitely tight net. That's sick. If we could get Scotty just to sit in, should we do it? Say something. Jamie's like, he's too scared. He's camera shy. Is he? I don't. It's about as camera shy as it gets. 
Yeah. He he is the he is the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Yeah. Let's talk about know. Scotty. Where did yeah. he come from? Where was what's his background? He 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 started working for Volcom since like early early nineties ninety three ninety four ninety five. Sick. And he's been a part of the the Volcom dynamic and the cogs of the wheels that make that happen for the last thirty years. But he runs a, a visual sales marketing. Yeah, I'd like to introduce you, Scotty Daniels. Is he in the shot? He's in the shot. When did you first hear of 1910? I guess you're working at Volcom. They're doing their shit. Jamie and Scove have always been really close friends of mine, and uh, <clears throat> we were able to develop this awesome relationship just through snowboarding and art, and and really more than anything else just good people right we that that was what attracted me to them and and hopefully them to me so um <laughs> yeah i think when a symbol was was kind of on the out and these guys were really looking to find another outlet to share their art because it's really about sharing um we were hanging out in the alley behind the shop and having a beer and they were talking about what's the next step and how we're going to facilitate sharing art and, you know, with, with everybody. And, and I have those capabilities. I've worked at Vulcan for well over 20 years and lots of mentors. And I wanted to be a part of what they were doing just holistically to share, not really thinking like this, this would turn into what it is today, which is absolutely fucking amazing. Um, so I just wanted to help out and we just kind of started doing some stuff together and, and, you know, there was a, a time where we decided to make a couple t-shirts and, you know, that graphic that you're wearing now was the original one. Um, and people went bonkers over it. Like, yeah. like yeah. people wanted, people wanted to be a part of what these guys are doing. Yeah. And, and, you know. I wanted to be a part of it. It's a throwback to the boom of the 90s of snowboarding. We're, we're just going to do our thing and not pay attention to what anybody else is, is doing. Um, of course, we have support from our mentors. Um, and, and big shout out to you know the guys like Richard Wolcott, Tucker Hall, Jason Starris, Ryan Emigart. Like, these are, you know, th I have a very deep, background with Volcom, you know, and not a bunch of other brands. And these guys have worked with everybody, yeah. but you know, I can only speak to the guys that have mentored me and taught me how to do what we're doing. And, uh, and they're still reaching out to us and they're still stoked to like be a part of what 1910 is because 1910 is just a brotherhood in collaborative art that people are interested in and so we share it and and you know there's an awesome uh, there's an awesome storm brewing for what we're doing and we're I mean we're really fucking stoked to like Eric you I had a, such an amazing conversation with you the first time we talked like it was awesome to talk to you and to feel the stoke that you're like that you have for snowboarding like that's yeah. what we're all doing is like you know we're all just trying to have fun, being old men, and still being stoked on snowboarding. And, like, there's nothing better than a good pow hack. Like, that's it. Sure, sure. Yeah, and you've got, yeah. So you got this uh, more wise mentality, you know? Not that, not that young, like, whatever happens, happens, which makes some of these companies happen. You've got, like, hey... Maybe we could do a bald face trip. Like, would a bald face trip? How if we do a brand? Could we work a bald face trip into that brand? Yeah, we we could do that. It's like, holy shit, a vehicle for. Well, these guys just talked about it. Like, we like making art together. Let's build a vehicle yeah. to facilitate. You know, that. what's that? 
ball face trip, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, a hundred percent. It's yeah, yeah. It's in the microphone now. Mike, yeah, so, yeah, I need to go to bald face. I've said it a million times on mic. Yeah, I I can't reiterate more um, what Scotty was saying about how the the support and foundation that we've had from the sponsorships that have carried us all these years. Volcom has been a huge part of that. That's so um, sick. They still continue to be a huge part of that. Um, we wouldn't be here without them, you know, and like we still have a huge relationship with with that entity and it, it's it's something that, you know, like so thankful and grateful for the support and 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 family that I've felt with Volcom and it's kind of like allowed me to learn, allowed me to evolve, but also see like, you know, what's important in in and as a as a company evolves and grows you know and, and they still do an amazing job to kind of keep that legacy alive and, it, and it, you see that with like them continuing to support people like myself and brian Noguchi who are you know like it, it, we've had a great run yeah yeah we've had amazing life experiences with them and grown up with them and um they seem to do it right. And that's the thing. Volcom seems to just like live life right. You know what I mean? As a company, they've, they've got the house on the North Shore, the surf thing. They've got the snowboard thing locked down. Like they do it right. It's, and it's inspiring, right? Like it's inspiring that now, 30 years later from 93 we're 30 years later and st- people are still wearing Volcom still supporting Volcom and still it still translates into oh it, like I know what it means when somebody shows up and they're wearing like a Volcom piece I'm like oh that's, that guy's cool yeah 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 so it's like it's been yeah. family you mentioned mentors too and uh, it was it was like a like a course in finance today listening to Jeff Pensiero just like the stuff off the top of his head write a business plan get it down get it jotted down and don't worry if you deviate from it you know he, that guy has got some serious serious business sense huh no I, yeah. you know absolutely when I sat down with Jeff in March we we just I knocked on his door and said, hey, I just wanted to say hi. And he invited me in and, and gave me some words of wisdom, which were amazing. You know, when, when uh, Jeff Pensiero is like E.F. Hutton, man, when fucking he talks, people listen. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, probably a lot of you guys out there that are going to hear this don't know who the fuck E.F. Hutton is, but <laughs> <laughs> us old guys do. Um, and it was cool to just have him give me a little bit of, of knowledge and just say... Like, hey, align yourself with the right people. Be conscious of what you're doing. Pay attention and 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 that's it. And pay attention to what you're doing. Do everything for the right reason. And that's all we're that's all we want to do. Like we just you know, we're we're not trying to get rich overnight or do anything like that. We just wanna enjoy each other's company for one. Jamie and, and, and Scove came down to Costa Mesa. And we spent the last couple of weeks um, curating this show and doing original art and a bunch of other really fun stuff. But the best times of all that stuff are when we're just hanging out and having a Guinness and yeah. and talking shop and being family. And, you know, Jamie's girl, Dini, is amazing. And, and we love Thalo and they love my children. And it, it, it's, it's a very mature situation that we're in right now you know it's and you know we were all hellraisers every single one of us when we were young you know we set the world on fire right yeah and then pour gas on top of it like yeah. we really were on fire and uh it's nice to like mature into this second phase of life and have this opportunity with these two fucking legends you know yeah man yeah, I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look, it's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah, it's all smoke and mirrors. 
Well, I want to thank all three of you guys. All the hanging out this weekend's been sick. The Mecca event is uh, when you were talking about there's a storm brewing. Like, I know there's a storm brewing with 1910. And I think these kinds of more community events, like we always had SIA, we always had ASR. And those were the places that we came together as a community and grew. Big, big shout out to Mikey LeBlanc for making this me- mecca. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, uh, Mike, he's an amazing human being. He's in it for all the right reasons. Uh, and we appreciate you, Mikey. We fucking really, really do appreciate you including us with what you're building on. Yeah, yeah. He's the man. It's given a chance to bring the community together in a way that we haven't felt in a long time. Yeah, right? You know, there's been this polarity that happened. I, I think, you know, COVID kind of shut a lot of the world down, yep. shut a lot of the industry down, and uh, kind of broke that that fabric that was kind of bringing us together. Yeah. And I, I, I'm so thankful that he's given us the opportunity to kind of rebuild that rift. Yeah. And like... Uh, I think it's important we don't lose that community because of online you know like sales and phones and all that shit like we need real life interactions and cool events like this to for an excuse to get together really is what it is they've always been an excuse to get together right you sure you do business at these things but you could do business. It was always secondary. Yeah. You know. Yeah, business was always secondary. The dollars and cents was always a secondary yeah. factor of what brought the community together. Right. And all the, the memories what came out of that was never connected to the business side. No, no, it was and always the, the, the memories that I carry with me <laughs> from the last thirty years of being a part of it. Yeah. Were never connected to the bottom line. It was always yeah. stuff like this. <laughs> having fun, making art listening to great music and bringing friends together to have a good time in one Get, place. Getting to see people from all over the world, yeah. That's super dope. Yeah. Right on, you guys. I think we got it. I think we got it. Yeah. Hey, Eric, once again, man. <laughs> Love you so much. Thank you so much for Thanks, having us Jamie. be a part of it. Thanks, Scope. Thanks, Scotty. Appreciate your time, Eric. Thank yeah, you. you guys are the best. All right. Right on. Let's party. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Effin' Rat shoutouts this week to Scof, Scotty, Jamie, Dini, Thalo, and Jake Scully. What a weekend. So fun to hang out with the 1910 crew. Extra special thanks to Tracy from Skyview Campers and his son, who drove uh, Skyview down to Denver for me to stay in while I was there. I can't wait to get one of these things up in Canada. So much love to all the listeners who make it to the end. Send me a message for a free sample of New Green's to wherever you are in the world. I just finished my morning berry greens and I feel fantastic. So be sure to come back next week for more Effenrad snowboarding presented by Skyview Campers and brought to you by Effenrad Productions.